Look at what's going on. On Sunday, September 24, 2006, Cassie Jo Stoddard was found dead in her aunt and uncle's house in Pocatello, Idaho. Her body had approximately 30 stab wounds. She had been cold-bloodily eliminated. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Cassie's family, but she had to number one. We have to stick with the plan. And she's perfect, so she's gonna die. <laughs> the perpetrators of this macabre act would be two friends, both 16 years old, who would record their entire plan with a chilling coldness. We will delve into the events of that night. They are so disturbing that they will seem straight out of a horror movie, and it would be hard to believe that everything had been done by teenagers. What kind of animal could come in and do this to her? What kind of person were we going to be finding during the investigation? Why did they choose Cassie as their victim? What were their motivations for meticulously planning this horrible crime? We will see step by step the young man's plans which were recorded by themselves, and how they carried out the crime against their friend. However, in the interrogation, the suspects will try to prove their innocence at all costs, and they would gradually reveal information that will help understand the motives for this horrendous act. This is the record of the last moments of two teenagers who confused fiction with reality and who were willing to go to extreme consequences due to an unprecedented fanaticism. Everything would happen in the small town of Pocatello in Idaho, United States, a predominantly Mormon city with a simple and extremely peaceful and safe life. However, everything would change in September 2006. Brian Draper and Tori Adamchek were two 16-year-old young men just like any normal high school teenager, without records that could predict their criminal fantasies. They were friends with their classmates and had no difficulties in school. Both became friends when they realized they were obsessed with cult movies and horror films. We're bad. We're bad. Hey, that sounds so shitty. We're evil. That sounds hey. even shittier. We're not, okay? They were sick psychopaths. Did that get pleasure of killing other people? That sounds good, baby. We're gonna go down in history. Bad. We're gonna be just like Scream, except real life terms. That we're gonna be murderers. But unfortunately, to carry out these disturbing desires, they would use the closest people they had in school, who were the perfect targets for these deranged young men. We found our victim and sad as it may be, she's our friend, but you know what? We all have to make sacrifices. Our first victim is going to be Cassie, Stoddard, and her God, friends. turn your brights off, asshole. Well, yeah, we'll find out if she has friends over. She's going to be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? I, I mean, like, holy shit. But why Cassie? Apparently, it is seen in the recordings that there was no greater motive than a simple reason. They were sure she was alone taking care of a house and that made her the perfect candidate for their movie. However, in the interrogation, we will see that this was only a facade. With a clear objective, they will begin to plan what would be their first assault. Cool. As and kills in three, September 22nd, 2006. We're skipping our fourth hour. We're writing our plan right now for tonight. It's gonna be cool. However, Cassie wouldn't be the only suitable one in the minds of these disturbed young people. They created a victims list on which there were several friends and classmates whose lives they would take to become infamous celebrities and for people to label them as serial criminals. Dude, I'm horny just thinking about it. Hell yeah! So we're gonna fucking kill her and her friends, and we're gonna keep moving on. I heard some news about Kirsten. She's gonna be home alone from 6 to 7, 
So we might kill her, then drive over to Cassie's thing, and scare the shit out of them, then kill them one by fucking one. Hell yeah. Why one by one? Why can't it be a slaughterhouse? Two by two and three by three? Because we got to keep it classy. So yeah, classy. it's going to be extra fun. You're evil. <laughs> the teenagers will shock with the coldness with which they speak but also with the enthusiasm that can be seen on their faces because they will become criminals. It seems that they have no greater interest in the victims, nor do they care that their friends are the chosen ones to be on the deadly list. However, the day would come when they will begin to carry out their horrifying plan and they will go for their first victim. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Cassie's family, but she acted number one. We have to stick with the plan. She's perfect, so she's gonna die. <laughs> Cassie Jo Stoddard was a very sociable girl. She never got into trouble, was extremely responsible, and was an outstanding student. She was an exemplary young friend to her entire community and a quite mature teenager despite her young age of 16. The last record of her was on Friday, September 22nd at 8.22 in the morning at Pocatello High School. While she was putting her notebooks in her locker, without any remorse, Brian decided to record her before ending her life. Hey, look, I don't know. Hello, Cassie. <laughs> I'm getting you on tape, okay? Say hi, please. Hi. Okay, see ya. That day, Cassie would take care of her uncle's house and pets, Frank Contreras and his wife Allison, for the weekend in a secluded house on Whispering Cliff Street. Her mother picked her up along with her boyfriend, Matt Beckham, from school at 3.45 in the afternoon. After the crime, the mom will tell the police that the last time she spoke to her was at 9.30 at night, when she called her to see how she was doing, and the teenager assured her that everything was fine and that she was just watching a movie with Matt. They said goodbye with the promise to call each other the next day, but they never spoke again. Days before, Matt asked Cassie if he could invite Brian and Tori to watch a movie together, since the four of them were good friends. The boyfriend's friendship with the young man was like any other, never suspecting anything from them, as he never saw any strange behavior towards Cassie or towards him. With the kindness that characterized the young girl, she saw no problem with seeing her classmates after school. This would be a mistake that would cost her life. The young people met with the couple around 8.20 at night, and they left around 9.30. They argued that they preferred to go to a local cinema to watch a movie, but that was far from true. We're here in his car. The time is 9.50, September 22nd, 2006. Um, unfortunately, we have the grueling task of killing our two friends and they are right in that house just down the street. They had gone to the house only with the intention of getting an idea of its layout and to leave the basement door open to come back later. We just talked to them. We were there for an hour. But... We checked out the whole house. We know there's lots of doors. There, there's lots of places to hide. Um, I locked the back doors, that's all a lot. Now we just gotta wait. And, um, yeah, we're, we're really nervous right now, but, you know, we're ready. We're listening to the greatest rock band We've waited for this for a long time. Pink Floyd. Before we commit the ultimate crime of murder. We waited for this for a long time. A long time. We'll stay tuned. Instead of going to the movies, they waited near the house, waiting to commit their terrifying act. Half an hour after the young people left the house, they cut the power to scare Matt and Cassie. With concern and seeing his girlfriend very scared, Matt wanted to stay with her to accompany her through the night. But his parents didn't give him permission, so they picked him up at 11.15 at night. They suggested that they go with them for safety reasons, but being responsible, as she was known to be, Cassie refused to give up her babysitting mission. That was the last time Matt would see his girlfriend alive. He called her around 12.30 in the early morning 
but Cassie didn't answer. When they got out of the car and entered the house again, Draper cut the power again. Meanwhile, they hid in the basement waiting for Cassie to come downstairs so they could reconnect the power. But perhaps out of fear, the girls stayed in the living room and slept there. In the meantime, Matt called Tori to see if he could meet up with them later, but he could barely hear him because he was whispering. He assumed they were still at the movies, so he finally hung up. However, in reality, the disturbed young people were in the basement waiting to take Cassie's life. Since the plan didn't go as expected, the young people went upstairs disguised with masks, gloves, and dark clothing. They brutally ended their friend's life with almost 30 stabs, 12 of which were fatal wounds to her chest. They left her there and left the house. We just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, oh I just killed God. Cassie. Oh, oh, fuck. That felt like it wasn't real. I mean, it went by so Shut fast. Shut the fuck up. We gotta get our act straight. It's okay. Okay. We'll, we'll, let's buy movie tickets now. Okay. Come on. Is it a bang? No. Goodbye. No one would imagine that this love for horror would lead them to turn a fantasy into reality. They wanted to imitate the antagonist's evil from fiction stories by making a movie that would end up frightening an innocent person, just like their idols on the big screen. Now they would do everything possible to elude the detectives and create a believable enough story to put the finishing touch on their perfect crime. After successfully carrying out the plan, both headed to an area of Black Rock Canyon, a semi-arid desert 16 kilometers from Pocatello, to bury all the evidence. They would try to burn the tape where they boasted about their act and bury it along with the clothes, notes, and everything that links them to the case. Now, they had to work on their alibi to appear innocent. Macabrely, the day after this horrendous crime, Adamchik spent the day with Cassie's boyfriend, Matt, as if nothing had happened. He even watched as his friend tried to call his girlfriend with no response. Only on Sunday the 24th, two days after the crime, Cassie's 13-year-old cousin found her lifeless in the living room. When the family returned home after their weekend trip, for the police, of course, the prime suspect was Matt, as he was the last person to see her alive. And also, when they informed him of Cassie's death, he didn't show much emotion, but he successfully passed the lie detector test. Matt also told them that night they were not alone, as two of his friends, Brian Draper and Tori Adamczyk, accompanied them during the moment of the evening. When Brian and Tori were called to testify, three days after the crime, the detectives were sure they were the culprits, but they needed the evidence and confession from the teenagers. However, they were not cooperating, and they would deny for hours being the perpetrators of the crime. Although they sounded convincing verbally, their body language raised the detectives' alarms. There's nobody that's gonna see you guys sneak back into the house. Yeah. I didn't have yeah. And there's nobody that's gonna see you around the house on Saturday. We're not going to find those people. Brian, while seemingly sure of what he was saying, almost to the point of being brazen and cold, made an unconscious movement with his head that would show he was not telling the truth. No, I did not have anything to do with the murder of Cassie. Tori? No. Both told the detectives that they left because they decided to go to the movies, but neither could answer what the movie was about. Here is where inconsistencies from both of them would start, and the confession would be revealed. First, Draper admitted they were not at the movies, but had been carjacking and lied because he didn't want to get in trouble. When they were going to give him a lie detector test to corroborate his story, he collapsed and said he needed to tell the detective something. With his parents present, he said they returned to the house to turn off the electricity and scare the couple. And they 
entered with masks to hide their identity in the style of the movie Scream. However, according to him, he was surprised when Adamchik actually started attacking her. <laughs> with immense guilt, he led the detectives to the area where the young people buried the evidence of the crime they had just committed. The young man's attitude of remorse raised suspicions in the police, who had the idea that there was something more to Cassie as their first victim. Do you love Cassie? Like, loves friend or what? You like, kind of have a crush on her movement. Did you have a crush on her movement? I did. And I was about to ask her out, okay. but I did. Brian was in love with Cassie, but he always felt like a loser and never asked her out. While well, this may not necessarily have been a motive to consider it a crime of passion, it could be the reason why he decided to confess to the crime. Upon confirming that everything they used was in the place indicated by Brian, the detectives suspected that the act had been much more macabre than what the young people were telling them. And everything would become clear when they recovered the tape, which was not completely burned. There, they saw how the crime was meticulously planned and organized by both young men. They could no longer blame each other or tell lies, now they only had to face justice. With all the evidence they found and that they themselves created, they had everything to give Brian Draper and Tori Adamczyk a long sentence. In 2007, they were sentenced to life in prison without parole for taking someone's life and for conspiring to do so. This case generated great repercussions as they were underage and were receiving a punishment as if they were adults. I think everyone is more than the worst thing they've ever done. Uh, and I think that policymakers can make decisions about how to punish them, but I think children are uniquely uh, more than their worst act. A life sentence for a minor takes away the opportunity for these young criminals to reintegrate into society after a process of rehabilitation. In 2012, the United States Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional for young people to receive life sentences without parole, regardless of the atrocity of the crime. Since 2016, this law must be applied retroactively, meaning that crimes committed by minors before the date of enactment could also be reconsidered. This would allow young people a second chance in life especially those who show deep remorse for the acts they committed in the past. Both Tori and Brian, now adults, regret their past actions. In fact, Tori doesn't even recognize himself and believes he is now a different person. I made a lot of mistakes, but they were... I don't know, I just think I look at myself now and I'm 21 and... I think how stupid I was at 16, and I just think how I feel like I'm paying for somebody else's mistakes at this point. As for Brian, he knows he will live forever with guilt, but that he has learned from his mistakes. I want to uh, have a chance at life. I understand that, uh, you know, Cassie can't, and I, I never ignore that, you know. She's dead, and not anything is going to change that. There are almost 1,500 cases like that of Brian and Tori that must be reviewed in the different states of the country to see if they are released or their sentence is reduced. However, both are still in prison, waiting for you to give them another chance, and only justice will decide if they have already paid enough for the horrendous crime against her friend.